So I'm going to be introducing the next topic, which is hypothesis testing. Um, so it's kind of closely related to what we did with confidence intervals. But basically, what we're going to do is we're going to have some unknown parameters. So here, we're going to start out with an example where we don't know the population mean. Right? So we're then going to develop two things. One is the null hypothesis. One is the alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is what we are going to assume is the true state of nature. The alternative hypothesis will be its complement or the exact opposite of that. Um, this might be something like we assume the average income in the U.S. is fifty thousand dollars. Right? We then take a sample. Maybe we see that it's seventy thousand in our sample mean. So that is evidence that's inconsistent with the null, inconsistent with what we assume to be true. If we saw something inconsistent with what we assume to be true, we would then reject the null. If you know, for instance, I saw a sample mean of fifty-two thousand. Well, if the true mean actually was 50,000, it's very likely that my sample mean, you know, isn't that far away. And so that probably wouldn't be strong enough evidence or it wouldn't be sufficient evidence and we would fail to reject the null. So notice here, we never say we accept the null. We just say that we either reject it or we fail to reject it, okay? So kind of this motivating example that we're gonna use is let's assume that I, you know, am interested in the ABV of mass market beers. I want to know, do they have um, an ABV less than, I think I chose two hearted here, 7%. So I take a sample of 36 different mass market beers and I find a sample mean of 4.5. So initially that seems pretty inconsistent with what I'm assuming to be true, right? I'm assuming that it's, you know, greater than or equal to, or sorry, I'm, I'm assuming that it's less than 7%. I found something that's pretty consistent with that. But the way that we set up this null hypothesis is whatever we're trying to test for. So there I was interested in, is the ABV less than 7%? I'm going to assume the opposite is true. So it's like I'm stacking the deck against myself. So in that previous example where I wanted to know, is the ABV less than 7%, I would actually assume that it's greater than or equal to that. I then take my sample. I have evidence that goes against that null, right? But we're always going to stack the deck against ourselves, kind of assuming the opposite of what we want to find is true. So We've got our null and alternative hypothesis. We'll kind of write those H subscript O and H subscript A. Sometimes in the homework or if you're looking online, sometimes the alternative hypothesis will be written H subscript one, right? But I think kind of using the A makes it a little bit easier, okay? So um, basically there's three different types of outcomes that we could see with a, with a uh, hypothesis test. So I'll kind of give you an example of each one. We'll go back to those slides. So. Let's assume that the mean is, I don't know, equal to 50,000. We'll use that income example, which would make my alternative hypothesis the exact opposite of that so that it's not equal to 50,000. So if what I'm assuming to be true is in fact true, I know that my sample means should be normally distributed around whatever that true population mean is. Here, I don't have a true population mean, but I've got an assumed true mean. So the way that we'll kind of indicate that is kind of mu subscript zero. This is my assumed true mean under the null hypothesis. So three scenarios. I take some sample evidence. Maybe I see a sample mean of 70,000. That's very inconsistent with my null. It's very strongly supports the alternative, right? So if I'm assuming it's 50,000, I see 70,000. It seems like that's very unlikely that what I assume to be true is in fact true. It's probably more likely if I saw a sample mean of 70,000 that the true mean is somewhere, right, a lot closer to that sample mean that I found. So if I saw that 70,000 scenario one, we would reject because we found kind of strong evidence that goes against the null. The second scenario is we... Oh. All right, so I was, what I was left off was, um, we also could find evidence, maybe that is 48,000, which would be pretty close to the mean that we're assuming the true population mean is in our null hypothesis. So there we would fail to reject because we found kind of weak evidence that went against the null, right? Excuse me. And then the third is if we found a sample mean that was exactly equal to 50,000, then 
we would fail to reject because we found evidence that, excuse me, supports the null. Okay. So kind of three different scenarios that we could have. <clears throat> so we'll go back. So those are kind of our three different scenarios. So I think, um, let me see here if I can go from this. So a kind of good analogy to think about how we come up with these null and alternative hypotheses are, um, if we think about a court case, what are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to find if someone's guilty, right? We think that they committed a crime. So what do we do? We stack the deck against ourselves, right? So we assume, right? So if we're trying to find if the defendant's guilty, our null hypothesis is going to be assuming the opposite is true or that they're innocent, right? Innocent until proven guilty, right? So we think you committed the crime, but we instead start out with the true state of nature, assuming that you're innocent. Our alternative hypothesis is then that you are in fact guilty. What do we then do? We go out and we try to find evidence, right? And if we have evidence that goes against the null, right? So maybe the murder weapon was found at your house, you know, you don't have an alibi, you had a motive, you know, all these things point to that you in fact are not innocent, then we reject the null, right? You go to jail. Right? If we find enough evidence that you're not innocent, we assume, you know, we, re we reject the null hypothesis. We assume that you actually are guilty. If you don't have enough evidence, so maybe there, you know, no more murder weapon was found, um, you know, you had kind of a loose alibi, then you're free to go, right? We didn't find enough evidence that went against what we assumed to be true, which was that you were innocent. Okay. So, right. Club doesn't fit, you must acquit. Uh, we fail to reject the null there. But I think it's kind of a, a nice non mathematical example to kind of think about what was the null and alternative hypothesis? How do we identify these things? So, the way that we'll write these, we have three different types of tests. Okay? So, the first we'll call a greater than test, which is that we're assuming that the true mean is less than or equal to some assumed true value. So, here, this mu subscript zero, this is going to be a number in practice. This would be like, you know, I assume the average income in the U.S. is less than or equal to, you know, 55,000, right? I then assume the exact opposite is true for my alternative, right? So my alternative hypothesis is what I'm trying to find, what I want to test for. I stack the deck against myself by assuming the opposite is true in my null hypothesis. And then notice we've got a greater than test where I've got a greater than sign in my alternative hypothesis a less than test, or we've got a less than sign, and then a not equal to test, right, with a not equal to sign in that alternative. So the name of the type of test is based off of that alternative hypothesis. <clears throat> so we'll work through a few examples. Um, we'll see, you know, how we do hypothesis testing changes a little bit for these one-sided versus this two-sided test. You can kind of see here, if I assume that the true mean, you know, true income, uh, average income is less than 55,000, well, then if I ever find evidence that's you know, the only evidence that goes against that would be if I find a sample mean that's above 55,000. Whereas if I just assumed it was equal to 55,000, well, then I could see a sample mean above or below it that would go against that null. So makes things a little bit different. <clears throat> but our main steps, no matter what type of test we have, is first, are we looking at a proportion or are we looking at a mean? Identify, you know, what, what are we interested in in terms of what statistic, the, the mean, the proportion, you know, we could do hypothesis tests for, for things like coefficients we'll talk about down the road. We then have to figure out what type of test it is and whether or not it's a one or a two-tailed test. Once we have that, right, we need to make sure we always put the equality in the null. So if we go back here, you'll notice, right, I always put the equality in my null hypothesis. That's just kind of normal convention. It really doesn't matter because the probability of any one value is zero, but out of like the convention, we always kind of put it on that null hypothesis. So how do we identify this for our earlier example? So I'm wanting to test for whether or not the average ABV is less than 7%. Right? So what do I do? Well, what I want to test for, that's my alternative hypothesis. So you can do this either way. You can first identify your alternative, or you can, you know, think about identifying your null first. I think, you know, whatever you're trying to test for, that's your alternative. We wanted to know, is that true mean less than 7%? So we assume the exact opposite is true in our null hypothesis, which is that it's greater than or equal to seven. Right? So here we've got a less than sign in our alternative hypothesis. We're gonna say this is a left tail test. You can kind of think about why too. If I've assumed 
that the true mean is 7% or higher, only evidence on the left side, only sample means that are, you know, below seven would be any evidence that goes against the null. If I find something over here, you know, on the right side, well, that actually is a value that's greater than or equal. It actually supports the null. So when we have a less than sign in the alternative hypothesis, only evidence on the left side of the distribution is going to be evidence where we might reject the null. Okay. All right. So, you know, if we're thinking about the English, right, we want to know, was it lower than this too hard of the 7%? So when we write this out, we've got our left tail test, right? Less than sign in the alternative hypothesis. Only evidence on the left-hand side is going to go against the null. Okay. So just some more practice kind of identifying these null alternative hypotheses. What if I had an example where I wanted to know whether or not the mean retirement age is different than 67? So here, this term of different than is a really good indicator that you have a two-tailed test. So if you're just thinking about, is it different than 67? Well, you could see, you know, sample evidence that is above or below 67, and that would go against that, right? It'd be a value that's different from 67. So what you're trying to test for is your alternative hypothesis. You want to know, is that mean not equal to 67? Any other number than 67? You assume the exact opposite is true, which is that it's exactly equal to 67, and we have a two-tailed test here. So once again, you can kind of envision on this one. So I've got my known alternative hypothesis from the previous example. So what should be true is if what I assume to be true is in fact true, my sample mean should be centered around that assumed true mean. Well, now I could see a sample mean over here that goes against the null, or I could see a sample mean over here that goes against the null, and they would both be, you know, possible, right? I don't know if it's insufficient enough, but it definitely goes against my null, or said differently, supports the alternative. So with a two-tailed test, you know, sample means on either side it could lead to us rejecting the null. So we're then going to talk a little bit about type 1, type 2 errors. I'll probably gloss over some of the type 2 error stuff for now. Um, but what we really need to know is we've got two types of kind of can do this decision box, right? Um, where let's assume that the null is true and I rejected the null, right? I'd be making a mistake, right? Because if the null is in fact true, I should have been failing to reject it. If it the null is true and I failed to reject it, well, that's a correct decision. And if the null is false and I rejected it, well, that's a correct decision. So whenever the null is true and I accidentally reject it, that's what we call a type one error. Anytime that it's false, but we failed to reject it, right? We, we, we should have been rejecting. We'll call that a type two error. We're mainly gonna focus on these type one errors because we're essentially gonna select them. It's gonna be very similar to our confidence intervals selecting alpha. Right. So alpha is going to be the proportion of times that we will make a type one error or said differently. Alpha is the proportion of times when the null will be true, but we accidentally reject it. Okay. So we're going to kind of use our same three benchmark values for alpha. Right? We have 90, 99, 95, 99% confidence levels. So our alphas are going to be 0 0.1, 0 0.05 and 0 0.01 more often than not. Okay. So I always thought this is kind of a nice, easy way, right? Type one error, if I'm, it's basically like a false positive, right? I'm rejecting the null, even though I shouldn't have been. So I, I assume that someone's not pregnant. I then reject the null here when clearly I shouldn't be. That's a type one error. And then if I fail to reject the null, I'm telling this person, no, you're not pregnant. Well, clearly I should be rejecting that, right? I should be telling them they are. So type one error, false positive. Type two error, we can think of as false negatives. So I can choose... Um, you know, alpha, right? Whatever level of type one errors I want to make. Um, go down here. We kind of already mentioned this, the benchmark values, type two error. I'm going to gloss over this for right now because what I really want to get to, and we'll come back to type two error probably after this next exam, um, is p values, right? So, what is a p value? So, here's kind of a nice visual, but I think I'm going to try to draw this out to kind of give you a little bit better of an idea. So, if I had a left-tailed test, 
So let's say I've got, could even use that example of the mean retirement age, but I'll just do that it's there. We'll just do less than 67, All right? So we have a left-tailed test. So we've assumed that it's greater than or equal to 67. Only evidence on the left-hand side would go against the null, right? This is what the distribution of my sample means should look like if what I assume to be true is in fact true. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a sample and maybe I see a sample mean of 62, okay? What I'm going to do is say, well, look, if what I assume to be true is in fact true, how unlikely was it for me to see a sample mean that was this far away from that assumed true value? Because if the variance is relatively large, right, if the variance of my sample means happens to be, or the standard deviation of my sample means tends to be pretty large, it may be very likely I see 62, even if the true mean was 67. So I'm going to turn this into a Z value. I can then look that Z value up on the table and I can tell you the probability that I saw sample evidence that was as inconsistent with what I assume to be true or anything even more inconsistent, right? So our P value for this left tailed test is gonna be the probability that I saw sample evidence that was as inconsistent with what I assume to be true as, as what I saw or anything even more inconsistent, right? Anything a further number of standard deviations away from that assumed true value. If this probability, you know, gets small enough, well, then I'm going to be okay rejecting the null, right? I mean, if I end up finding the p-value is, you know, 0.4, there's a 40% chance that, you know, I saw something this far. Well, that's pretty high. But if I get this down to 0 0.04, well, man, it, it, you know, this would be a very unlikely for me to see if what I assume to be true was in fact true. So if this p-value gets low enough, what's probably what we're okay saying is, well, look, it was so unlikely, the probability was so small for me to see 62 here if the true mean was 67, that 67 probably isn't the true mean. The true mean is probably a lot closer to 62. Okay? And if that probability gets small enough, we're going to reject the null. When is it small enough? Well, basically, whenever that p-value is less than alpha, right? So we're choosing alpha, right? We're saying, look, if I chose an alpha of 0.1, for instance, anytime I see something that has a p-value less than 0.1, I'm going to say, well, that's evidence that's inconsistent enough with what I assume to be true, that it probably isn't true, right? So anytime it falls below kind of this threshold alpha we're setting, the p-value gets smaller than that, we reject, right? We reject the null. We found something that's kind of you know, very inconsistent with what we assume to be true. Now, the other ones are going to be very similar, right? So I had did a left tail test example. The right tail test, it's the exact same thing. But now, only evidence on the right-hand side goes against the null. So I'm going to have to be looking for the probability I saw something this far away from my assumed true mean or any greater, right? Um, and then two-tailed test, we kind of have two tails. So I'll go over that one because that, that one's a little bit unique as well. So for the two-tailed test, You think about back to the, just so I have these numbers easy in my mind. All right. Let's say instead we had a two-tailed test, right? Well, even if we sit, still saw like a sample mean that was as far away as we did earlier, right? We could find the probability that I saw a sample mean that was that far away from my assumed true mean or anything even further. But with a two-tailed test, it would have been equally as likely for me to see a value that was that inconsistent with the null, but on the other side. So every value here is going to have a counterpart on the other side that would have been equally damning evidence of, you know, or equal evidence that would be equally going against that assumed true value. So when we have a two-tailed test, I can turn, you know, this value into the Z value, look it up in the table. It's just that now this only represents half my p-value, right? With a two-tailed test, it would have been equally as likely for me to see something on the other side. So I'll have to take this area, multiply it by two, the twos cancel, and I'd be left with my p-value. Right? So for a two-tailed test, we can find the area that's in one of the tails. We just have to remember our total p-value is that times two, okay? So that's kind of a brief introduction to hypothesis testing.
Um, let's try to work through some problems here. So this is kind of a more mathematical kind of setup of it. If I have a greater than test, you know, my p-value is going to be the probability that I saw the z-value I did or anything greater. Left tail test, probably I saw the z-value I did or anything less, right, even larger negative number. And then two tail test, right, I have to find the area in one of the tails and then multiply it by two. Okay. Why won't this? There we go. So here's our steps, right? We're going to determine the null and alternative hypothesis. We're going to specify what alpha we want. We'll calculate our what we call z statistics. So when I'm turning my sample mean into a z value, we kind of have a different fancy name for it, which is because it's based off of a assumed true mean, right? When we create this z value, it, it may not be the number of standard deviations away from the true mean. It's going to be the number of standard deviations away from the assumed true mean. Okay. So just kind of semantics there. And then finally, once we have that test statistic or that z statistic, we can find the p value. Find the you know probably I saw something that inconsistent with what I assume to be true or even more inconsistent, and then if that p value is less than alpha, I reject the null. If it's not, I fail to reject. So let's go back to our example of the mass market beers and kind of say, okay, look, we found sample evidence that was pretty inconsistent with what we assume to be true, right? It was four point five percent. Can we reject our null hypothesis? Which if we go back, remember we wanted to test for whether or not that mean was less than 7%. So our null hypothesis was assuming the exact opposite is true. But then think about if what we assume to be true was in fact true, our sample mean distribution should be centered around this assumed true mean of 7%. We then found a sample mean, I think it was of four and a half, right? I believe it gives us a known population variance. Once again, kind of like with confidence intervals, we have to walk before we can run. Um, and so now it just becomes, okay, I've got my Z value equation is typically looks like this, where my denominator is the standard deviation of the sample mean. So it's the only difference now, instead of a Z value, we're calculating a Z statistic, like I said, kind of semantics, but we're subtracting the assumed true mean. Other than that, though, everything's exactly the same as what we were doing before. So we've got a left tail test. So I'm going to turn this into a Z score, right? So if I do that here, I got what? 4.5 minus 7 divided by the square root of 1 over, I think it was 36 mass market beers. I'm going to go back and see if I'm correct here. Yeah, 36. Okay. So whatever this Z score is, I can look that up in the table, find the area to the left. And for a left-tailed test, that represents my p-value. Okay. Don't know what this is off the top of my head, but we'll see once we, I think I've got it in the slides here. So did the math ahead of time, scroll down. So negative 15, right? Well, this is pretty wild. I mean, we, we hopefully are getting somewhat comfortable or familiar with um, how many standard deviations or what a large z-value is, right? So if our table only goes to like negative four, the probability that we see negative 15, right, or anything to the left, I mean, this is basically going to be zero, right? I mean, the area to the left of negative four, I think, on the table is like 0. 0.0001. So this is going to be, you know, with a z-score of negative 15, <laughs> we're going to be really close to zero. So here, if I've got a p-value that's approximately zero, well, that's definitely going to be less than the alpha of 0 0.05, which I believe is what we had set in the problem. Yes, alpha of 0 0.05. So, you know, it's basically zero. We're going to be able to reject. Yeah. And, you know, one nice thing about this p-value approach is I can make rejection decisions at multiple levels. So in this one, it's pretty easy. I mean, a p-value of zero, that's going to be less than an alpha of 0 0.01. It's going to be less than an alpha of 0 0.05. That's going to be less than an alpha of 0.1. And then I had craft beer example, so I had to throw a meme in there. All right. So let's go back, and here we'll get in a taste of a right tail test. So we'll do the you know, mean retirement age one. I'm kind of beating this example to death here. But um, we want to see whether or not we have a mean retirement age that's greater than 67. 
we find a sample mean of 71 and we have this known population variance, right? So what would the p-value be? Well, just to kind of be real complete, let's identify everything first. So we wanted to test for whether or not that mean retirement age was greater than 67. So we then assume the opposite is true in our null. Right? We're then going to draw out. We don't have to necessarily draw this out. I just think it helps. If what I assumed to be true was in fact true, my sample mean should be centered around that. I saw a sample mean value of 71. Okay? So I need to turn that value into a z-score. Now for a right-tailed test, right, evidence on the right-hand side is inconsistent with the null, right? Evidence on the right-hand side actually supports the alternative. So now my p-value, because kind of our loose interpretation of our p-value is, it's the probability I saw evidence, sample evidence, that was as inconsistent as what I found or anything more inconsistent. So in this case, more inconsistent with the null means seeing an even larger sample mean. So now my p-value is going to be the area to the right of my test statistic that I calculate. So the test statistic or the z statistic, that's just my number of standard deviations away my sample evidence was from the assumed true mean. So what did we have there? We took our sample mean, subtracted the assumed true mean, divided by square root of this. Right? So if I remember right, so we've got oops, 71 minus 67 over the square root of 25 over, no, I think it was 81 over 25, right? So we'll figure out what that Z value is. Uh, I'm gonna cheat, <laughs> Let's skip ahead here. So we got our null alternative. There we go, 2.22, okay? So we found a Z value or a Z statistic of 2.22. We want the area to the right. So what we're gonna have to do is look this Z value up in the table. The table gives me the area to the left. If I want the area to the right, one minus that. Okay. So I go to my Z tables in a second here. Oops, didn't have them blown up. There we go. So I've got 2.22. So I'm gonna scroll down here. I can get this all in one line. So the 0 0.02 column is right here. So 2.22.9868, right? So remember, that's not our p-value. That's the area to the left. We then had to subtract that from one, right? So we get about what, 0 0.0132, if I'm doing math in my head correct here. So our p-value is pretty small, right? 0 0.0132. Our rejection decision is always, burn this into your memory going into the next exam, we only reject if that p-value is less than alpha. So here, a p-value of 0 0.0132, we can compare that to three benchmark alpha values. Right? So yes, we can reject at the 10% significance or the 90% confidence level. It's less than 0 0.05, so we can reject with at the 5% significance or with 95% confidence. It's not quite less than 0 0.01, so we would say we fail to reject the null at the 1% significance level or we fail to reject with 99% confidence, okay? So once you have that p-value, you can compare it to several alphas and figure out what levels we can reject this null hypothesis at. All right, so oops. let's go through one more example because um, I think we haven't really completely worked through a two-tailed test yet. So with a two-tailed test, right, we have a setup like this where a researcher expects average back-to-school spending to differ from a reported amount of $606.40. They take a random sample of 30 families and find a sample mean that is, in fact, different than that. We've got a known population variance. What would the known alternative hypothesis be? Well, we want to test for whether or not it's different from $606.40. So not equal to that $606.40, meaning we assume the opposite is true, which is that it's exactly equal to that value. So here we've got a two-tailed test, right? And I think I'll round the values here as I'm writing this out, but it was like 60640 maybe. Let's see if I can remember that right. So we've got a two-tailed test. 
And our sample means, if what we assume to be true is in fact true, should be centered around that value. We then went out and took a sample. I think it was, we saw a sample mean of like $622. What we're then gonna do, and here's where, you know, maybe, I don't know, good way to kind of prevent from making mistakes. If I've got a two-tailed test, when I initially draw it out, thinking about, okay, here would be, if this is a right-tailed test, this would be my p-value, but I've got a two-tailed test. So evidence, any value I see that's above the assumed true mean, there would have been equally damning evidence that was just as far away on the other side. And now the other side, that evidence also goes against the null. With our one-tailed test, evidence on the other side actually supported the, the null, right? But here, because we have it's exactly equal to a specific value, evidence on either side goes against. So we have to remember, once I find the area in this tail, I need to multiply it by two. From there, it's just a matter of that z-score equation. So we take the sample mean that we found, subtract the assumed true mean, divide by the square root of, and I forget the variance, I think it was like 4,225, 4, and then I think I had a sample size of 25. Right. So we'll cheat once again, we'll skip ahead and see exactly what that math works out to be. All right, so yeah, oh, sorry, it was a sample size of 30. I'll write that down so we'll go back. So here I've got my Z statistic, I need to find my p-value. So my Z statistic, is 1.39. So this is where it can get a little bit tricky. I want the area to the right, and then I want to multiply it by two. The problem is the table only tells me the area to the left, right? So if I go look up 1.39 in my standard normal table, so one point, oops, let's see, should be able to get here. There we go. 1.3, nine looks like it's 0 0.9177 so remember that's the area to the left of my z value i wanted the area to the right so i need to subtract that from one this is what 0.0823 if i'm doing math in my head correct i then have to remember that's only half of my p value i still need to multiply it by two so my p value is that times two or 0.1646. Now this is kind of an easy one, right? So the two-tailed test, I guess the difference there is you do everything the same way, right? You're gonna find the area in your tail. So you'll take that sample mean, turn it into a Z value, find the area in your tail. You just have to remember at the very end, you have one more step, which is to multiply by two. If you draw out a two-tailed test initially, kind of shading in both of these tails, that might be a way to kind of prevent you from forgetting to do that. Right? And then here, if we only reject when the P value is what? Less than alpha. Well, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.01. It's not going to be less than any of those. We would say that we fail to reject the null at every single significance level or said differently at every single confidence level. Okay. All right. So that kind of, um, you know, we could compare both of these. I just have a slide where it completely compares these, you know, if I wanted to go down to an alpha of 0.2, well, then maybe in that second example, right, I could reject the null. But our typical benchmarks are going to be kind of the same as confidence intervals, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.01. Um, I just kind of threw this one in there to, to make the case that you can, if you, you know, you're okay rejecting it with 80% confidence, you could choose an alpha of 0.2. Okay. Um, so that kind of introduces the idea of finding p-values, working through some examples where we're looking at a sample mean, uh, where we have a known population variance. So we're gonna have two other types of examples that we could see. Uh, one of them is gonna be for proportions, right? So it's gonna work a little bit differently. The kind of nature of finding p-values is gonna be the same. It's just that, you know, when we were dealing with proportions before, right? It's a slightly different calculation for the standard deviation. So that's really the only thing that's going to change in these examples is how we calculate our Z statistic. Okay. So if we go, I'll probably go through this relatively quick, right? Because nothing's really going to be different from what we were doing with means. We still are going to have a greater than, a less than, and a not equal to test, right? So once again, the name of the test, kind of think about greater than or right-tailed test, right? A greater than sign in the alternative hypothesis or only evidence on the right goes against the null. 
left tail test, we got a less than sign or a less than test, less than sign the alternative, only evidence on the left goes against the null, and then a not equal to test, not equal to sign in the uh, alternative. We're just looking to see, is the proportion different from this assumed true value, right? Don't We don't care if it's above or below, evidence on either side could go against the null. All right, so yeah, everything's the same here, right? I've just, instead of a mean, I'm looking at a proportion. So I've got one and two tail tests. The only difference is going to be how we calculate that Z statistic. So we'll go back and write this out. So maybe we can kind of see the, hopefully see the similarities. So here's my Z statistic for a sample mean. Here's how I do it for a sample portion. So before, oh, sorry. <laughs> we have our sample mean minus the assumed true mean. And then we divide by the standard deviation of that statistic. Now, you could do this in steps, or we can kind of sub in that formula that we have for our standard deviation of our sample means. Also, I'm going to switch back to using that green one. This black marker is kind of dying on me. For our sample proportion, it's going to be the same setup. I take the sample statistic, subtract the assumed true population statistic, and then divide by the standard deviation of that statistic. It's just now, typically, what would the standard deviation of our sample proportions be? Usually it's the square root of P times one minus P over my sample size, but I don't have a known population proportion here, but I do have an assumed true population proportion, right? So that's the only difference there from what we were doing before, um, before hypothesis testing when we were dealing with proportions is that now that standard deviation we no longer have to, like with confidence intervals, we had to use like our best estimate of what the population proportion was. So we use our sample. Now we have an assumed true population proportion. So that's what we're going to use to calculate our standard deviation. Okay. But you can kind of see it's like a similar setup, right? It's just that the standard deviation of each statistic is a little bit different. Okay. All right. And then same kind of thing to apply. Once I have my Z statistic, look at my P value, depending on if the left, right, two tailed test, compare that P value to alpha. If it's less than alpha, I reject. So let's work through one here where let's say I want to test for whether or not more than 15% of mother, Indiana mothers smoke while pregnant. So we're going back to that birth data. And we say, okay, I want to know whether or not more than 15%. So that's my alternative hypothesis. That's what I'm trying to test for, right? So I'm saying, is this proportion greater than 15%? That's my alternative hypothesis. I assume the exact opposite is true for my null, which is that it's less than or equal to that 15%. Now notice, I'm talking percentages here. When we're dealing with proportions in the actual calculations, we should be using that, that decimal form, right? So I've got what type of tailed test? Well, I've got a greater than sign in the alternative. So I've got a right tailed or a greater than test, okay? So kind of think about what I've got here. So I've got 72 out of 400 mothers smoke. I'm going to cheat real quick. So that's 0.18. So we've got our null alternative hypothesis. I'll kind of work through this one here, and then we'll kind of go back to the slides. So I had this as my null hypothesis. Right? What should be true about the distribution of my sample proportions, if what I assume to be true is in fact true, is that they should be centered around that value. I can calculate my sample proportion here. It wasn't directly given to me, but I was told that 72 out of 400 mothers smoke while pregnant, which ends up being a sample proportion of 0.18. I've got a right-tailed test. So to find my p-value, that's the probability that I saw sample evidence that was inconsistent with the null, as inconsistent as what I found, or anything more inconsistent, well, more inconsistent with assuming that's less than or equal to 0.15 would be seeing values even further above that, right? So here, this area in the right, or my right tail, will be my p-value. From there, it's just a matter of calculating my test statistic. So we had that equation earlier. Can do that down here. So just 0.18 minus 0.15 divided by the square root of what was my assumed true proportion? 0.15. Pretty big sample size here. Um, and whatever this z value is, 
I then look that up on the table. Table gives me the area to the left. I wanted the area to the right for a right tail test. So I then subtract that from one. Okay. So that's all kind of we got here. So if we actually plug everything into that Z statistic equation, we should get about whoops, 1.68, right? So 1.68 is my Z value. So I'm going to look that up in the table. So 1.68, so 0.9535. So my Z value is 1.68, 0.9535. 3.5 was kind of the area to the left. I wanted the area to the right, so I needed to subtract that from 1, or I get this p-value of what? 0 0.0465. Okay. So what levels can I reject at? Well, is this less than 0.0465? This is what I had earlier. So we only reject if our p-value is less than alpha, so we had what, 0 0.0465, is that less than an alpha of 0.1? Yep, so I can reject at the 10% significance level. So we can kind of think about here, here's my significance level, here's my confidence level, or I, so I can reject at the 10% significance level or with 90% confidence. Is it less than 0 0.05? Well, barely, but it is. So I can reject at the 5% significance level or with 95% confidence. It's not quite less than 0 0.01, so I would fail to reject at the 1% significance level, or I can't reject it with 99% confidence. Okay. So, you know, hopefully you can kind of see where these proportions, it's really the same setup. This is exactly how we did a right-tailed test before. It's just test statistic equations or those Z statistic equations look a little bit different. Okay. All right. So let's go back here. Um, See how many examples I brought in here. Okay, we'll work through this with this one, I guess. So let's say um, I'm going to switch this one up because we haven't done another. I, I want to do another two-tailed test example. Um, here, the way this is phrased, it should be whether or not more than. So I'm going to change this, and we're going to have to change things along the way. So. Portion of the population owning a gun is different than 50%. So we'll give us just another example of a two-tailed test, which I think is, is important. So, um, and this text box moved around on me now, so don't don't uh, pay any oh gosh, don't pay any attention to the, the it's not the correct answer. We're going to work through these ones. The, the, the answers are going to be wrong. So I'll work through on the on the dot cam and we'll kind of work through what they should be. Um, so I've got whether or not the proportion is different than 50%. So that's what I want to test for. Right? So that's going to be my alternative hypothesis. So identify my alternative, which is that I want to know is this proportion not equal to 50% or not equal to 0.5. I assume the exact opposite is true, which is that it's exactly equal to 0.5. The proportion of people who own guns in the U.S. is, ex or sorry, I'm talking and I didn't write down what I said. We're assuming that the proportion of people who own a gun is 0.5. Right? So I've got this two-tailed test. If what I assume to be true is in fact true, my sample proportions should be centered around that value. I found sample evidence, I believe, that was like 0.41, right? So for a two-tailed test, I have to remember, I can find, okay, what's the probability I saw sample evidence that was as inconsistent with what I assume to be true as what I found, or anything even more inconsistent? But now for every value here, right, every value that's this far away below the assumed true value of 0.5, it would have been equally as likely for me to see a value that was that far away but above 0.5, but now the values above 0.5, they go against the null as well. So I can find the area here, but that only represents half my p-value, so I then need to multiply it by two. Okay. So, you know, we go back, just use this general form of the equation, 
We're going to plug in all of our values. So we have what? 0 0.41, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And I think our sample size was, I don't remember. <laughs> so I'll go back. Sample size of 100 people, right? So now I've got everything plugged in. It's just a matter of getting this entered into my calculator correctly. Right? Now, nice cleaner version of that should be here on this next slide, right? Where I plug everything in and I end up with negative 1.8 is my test statistic, okay? So negative 1.8 is that Z statistic. So I go back to my drawn and I think about, okay, look, I turned this sample proportion into a Z value and it was negative 1.8. I can find that area to the left. Remember that, oh yeah, it's a two-tailed test. So once I find that area, I need to multiply it by two. So we go to our table. Maybe negative 1.8. So negative 1.8, zero is the first column. So 0 0.0359. So 0 0.0359, but that's not my p-value. That's only half of my p-value, right? So I need to take that, multiply it by two. Uh, I think I'm doing this math in my head correct. It'd be about 0 0.0718. Now, what levels can I reject at? Well, we only reject if my p-value, here, I'll write it out again, is less than alpha. So is my p-value of 0 0.0718, is it less than 0.1? Is it less than 0 0.05? And is it less than an alpha of 0 0.01? Yes, so I can reject at the 10% level, but it's not less than 0 0.05 or 0 0.01, so I fail to reject at the 5 and 1% significance level, or I fail to reject with 95 or 99% confidence. Okay. So um, we'll be working on these once I'm back next week. Um, together, we'll go through some more problems. Um, the next connect assignment, we'll have some hypothesis testing stuff that actually it's going to be a practice assignment uh, just to get some more practice going into that, that exam, um, which will be um, the, the, the Friday after, um, oh, what's the date? It'll be 17th. So they, right at the beginning of, of April, I'll put an announcement up on Canvas. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of hypothesis testing, p-value approach for proportions and sample means when we know a population variance. Just like with confidence intervals, I'll also be putting up a video where I go through um, what do we do when we have a sample mean and an unknown population variance, right? All we have is a sample variance. All right, so got one more type of example that we could cover. So just like with confidence intervals, we had a situation where we were looking at a sample mean and we knew the population variance or standard deviation. We have proportion examples. Both of those we use the standard normal or the Z tables. We said what might be a more realistic case is when we have a sample mean, but we don't know the population variance. All we have is a sample variance, okay? So the steps are gonna be exactly the same as what, and actually ignore this, this isn't critical value. We're going to do this after the, uh, we're going to do this after um, the exam, do critical values after uh, the next exam. So the only difference is now when we calculate our test statistic, it's going to be a T statistic, right? So before, um, you know, we had our test statistic was a Z statistic. So test statistic is like the general term, and then you specify what distribution it's coming from with either Z or T. The only other thing that's also gonna change is that we look up our p-value, we're gonna have to be using our student T tables, okay? So let's say you wanna test for whether or not, um, you know, the hypothesis that whether or not the average home price is different than 90,000, okay? You got a sample of 51 homes, and you find 85,000 is the average, and you have a sample variance of 100,000. What would my null alternative hypothesis be? Well, what I'm trying to test for, right, that's our alternative hypothesis, is that is the home price different from 90,000? Or said differently, our alternative hypothesis, is it not equal to 90,000? We assume the opposite is true, stack the deck against ourselves, okay? So we automatically know going into this that we have a two-tailed test and kind of draw out what we've got going on 
like so. The black markers died. So our sample means should be normally distributed around whatever the true mean is. Well, we don't know the true mean, but we have an assumed true mean. Remember where that came from. We had our null and alternative hypothesis. We assumed it was equal to 90,000, which made the alternative that it was not equal to that. We found sample evidence that was inconsistent with the null, but was it inconsistent enough? Right? Does, you know, is it far enough away from 90,000 that that probability of seeing something that far away is pretty low? In fact, what do we need it to be? We need it to be lower than that probability, that p-value to be less than alpha. Right? That's when we can reject. So what I'm going to do, now, if I remember before I actually, I should have done this before I started to draw out this, this t-distribution, my p-value will be the probability that I saw sample evidence that was as inconsistent with what I found, right, if what I assumed to be true was in fact true, or anything more inconsistent. But for a two-tailed test, it would have been equally as likely to see something that was 5,000 above or more, and all of these values go against the null as well. So I can find the area in this tail, but for a two-tailed test, I have to remember to find my p-value, I have to multiply it by two. So how can I find that area in that tail? Can I turn this into a t-statistic, right? Then I can look that value up on my student t-table, and then uh, multiply it by two. Now, I think we had here our sample size was 51. So one thing we talked about with confidence intervals is my degrees of freedom, right, is n minus one. So here, my degrees of freedom is what, 50? So, you know, how do I calculate my test statistic, right? I'll go back to the slides here in a second, but I think all right, I think I already showed you the general form. It's gonna look exactly like what we were doing before with our sample mean. It's just now, instead of a population variance, we have to just use a sample variance, right? That's the only difference. Once I plug the values in, nothing looks at, you know any different, right? So I do this, right? I get what, nine, or uh, sorry, 85,000 minus 90,000 divided by the square root of, I think this was like 100 million. I'm going to cheat a little bit to figure out what this is. So we had our two-tailed test. Looks like my test statistic is negative 3.57, right? So I get negative 3.57. Oops, excuse me. That's not the end. So I don't have a slide for this. But that's not what I wanted to do either. Or actually, yeah, we'll go here. Uh, let's go stop here. So negative 3.57 is my test statistic, right? So I go to my student t-table. Now remember the student t-table works a little bit differently. We have to identify kind of what area in the tail we want and at what our degrees of freedom is. Well, we don't have a desired area in the tail. We, that's how we use it for confidence intervals. We have a test statistic. So that's the numbers in the middle. So it's kind of like the exact opposite of the z-table, right? The z-table, our probabilities are in the middle and then our z-values are the row and column headings. Here, the row and column headings are the area in the tail and the numbers in the middle, those are our t values, okay? So we're gonna go down to a degrees of freedom of 50, right? And we're gonna try to find our test statistic. Now, one of the problems with the, with the student t distribution, it's not a problem, but it only is looking at the right side of the distribution, but it doesn't matter, right? Because it's a symmetric distribution, if I wanted to have the negative values, it would literally be the exact same table, just everything would be negative, right? So the area to the right of positive two is the same as the area to the left of negative two. So if we have a negative test statistic, we can just ignore the negative sign when using the student t-table because it's a symmetric distribution. So I've got negative 3.57, that's not a value in here. So here's another limitation of the t-table. Now, when it comes to the exam, if I gave you a test statistic and asked you for a p-value or a rejection decision with a example where we only had a sample variance, I would give you a test statistic that works out to be one of these exact numbers. So the examples that I'm going to go through, I'll show you somewhere what we would do if it wasn't the exact number. But um, I think that should actually you know, make it even, even easier 
uh, make it even easier once I give you a test just that, that's exactly in this table because here I know that the area to the right of 2.676 is 0 0.005, right? So that was like the area to the left of negative 2. Point, what did I say? 76 or something. This area was 0 0.005. So if I've got negative 3.57 as my test statistic, this area is gonna be even smaller, right? Pretty close to zero, okay? Well, if this area is pretty close to zero, when I multiply it by two, I'd still end up with a p-value that's pretty close or approximately zero. Right? So on the exam, what I would be more likely to do is give you an example that worked out like to be, uh, let me see, let me make sure I get the right value. Okay. So on the exam, I might say, okay, look, assume that the test statistic is negative 2.009. What's my p-value? Right. So we have negative 2.009 instead of that negative 3.57. It's a two-tailed test. So whatever area we find here, we need to multiply it by two. So I go to my t-table degrees of freedom 50. I find my test statistic of 2.009. I then go up and see, okay, the area to the, the left of negative 2.009 or the area to the right of positive 2.009 is 0 0.025, okay? So this area is 0 0.025. When I multiply it by two, I get a p-value of 0 0.05. Now, this is where it'll get a little bit tricky. Oh, sorry. <laughs> is it less than 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01? Well, yes, it's less than <clears throat> 0 0.1, so I can reject at the 10% significance level. It has to be strictly less than. It's not less than or equal to. So technically, if I had a p-value of 0 0.05, I would fail to reject at the 5% significance level, and it's definitely not less than 0 0.01, so I'd fail to reject at that level as well. Okay. So let's try to work through another example. I mean, like I said, this is pretty similar to what we were doing when we had a known population variance, except for we have to use that student T distribution. Okay. All right. So now we're going to say, okay, let's say I want to test for whether or not the average weight of someone born to a mother who used alcohol during their pregnancy is less than the national average. Right? So that's what I'm trying to test for. That's going to be my alternative hypothesis. So is that mean less than the national average of 3,287? I stack the deck against myself, assuming the exact opposite is true, that it's greater than or equal to that value. I then use my sample evidence to see, does it go against the null enough? Right? So let's start drawing this out. Got the assumed true mean of 3,287. We had that the mean was less than 3,287. We assume the opposite is true up here. We've got a left-tailed test, right? Less than sign of the alternative hypothesis. Sorry, I mixed these up. This should be H subscript zero. This is H subscript A. So our alternative hypothesis tells us what type of test. We have a less than sign, so a less than or left-tailed test or only evidence on the left side goes against that null. It right, goes against that, what we assume to be true. Let's see if I can remember this number. I think it was 3,132. The probability we saw evidence that was as inconsistent with what we assume to be true as what we found or anything more inconsistent is just the area to the left here. Okay. So this should be pretty easy, right? I turn this into a T value or a T statistic. Once I do that, I look it up in the table and it's just the area to the left. Don't have to multiply by two. It's not a two-tailed test or anything like that. Okay. So I go back, calculate my test statistic. Just a kind of reminder of what that looks like. So I get what? 3132 minus 3287 divided by, I don't recall. <laughs> so we've got what? 4,000. The variance is 439,907. And then my sample size here was I had 400 births, okay? 
So this is going to be another scenario where we see there's some limitations to the student t-table, right? So here, um, oh, I don't think I wrote down what that test statistic is. Uh, let me see. We plug all those values in. We should get negative 4.6, right? So negative 4.674, okay? Um, I'm going to give you a slightly more interesting test statistic. So this is what it would work out to be. This test statistic is so large, right? And our degrees of freedom here would be what? N minus one, so 400 minus one or 399, right? Now we said with the confidence intervals, as the degrees of freedom gets higher and higher, this gets closer and closer to a standard normal distribution. In fact, at a sample size of 400, we probably could approximate it with a standard normal distribution and we would get a very, very, very uh, approximately close answer. Right? If I'm thinking about my standard normal distribution, negative four standard deviations away is a lot, right? It's a pretty large Z statistic. It'd be a pretty large T statistic. So we know that this is probably going to be pretty close to zero, right? Let's instead, so we go to our T table. What we'll find out is, let's see. Um, so if we go down here, <clears throat> notice it starts making big jumps. So it goes 200 to 500. Well, my degrees of freedom is 399. I can't find that. But I mean, if we look at these T statistics, right, they're very, very similar, even in between 200 and 500 is my degrees of freedom. So on the exam, I wouldn't give you something that this is that this hard. I would give you something that's exactly one of these numbers, but just kind of that limitation sometimes in the, like the connect. Uh, if, if you're in between two, you know, always err on the side of caution. So actually go down degrees of freedom. So we could use this column to figure out the p-value. But notice my test statistic of 4.67 isn't one of the values here, right? In fact, the area to the right of 2.6 is 0 0.005. So the area to the right of 4.6 would be really, really close to zero. Right, and the area to the right of 4.6 is close to zero. That also means it's a symmetric distribution, so the area to the left is similar. So we'd have a p-value basically zero here. It's going to be less than any alpha we want to look at. Mm -hmm. Might be a more difficult one. Let's say I had something like uh, oh, and I just had that pulled up, and I was going to remember one of the values. So let's say, let's say instead I told you the test statistic was one point no no one point six five three. Right, so you go up. You know, as you find the degrees of freedom that was closest to the, the one that you had, go up 0 0.05, right? So that would be my p-value. And then that's what I can compare to alpha to see if I reject. Right? So it's a very similar procedure to what we did with the other confidence intervals. The only difference is we're kind of using this student t-table and we're constrained a little bit, right? At every degrees of freedom, we only have six test statistics that we could possibly look up, right? Now in practice, what would you do? Well, for instance, my degrees of freedom was 31, and I found a test statistic that was in between 2 and 2.4. Well, I know the area to the right of 2.04 is 0 0.025. The area to the right of 2.4 is 0 0.01. So the area for any test statistic in the middle here, like 2.2, it would just be within this range, right? So we can start to put p-values in ranges with the student t distribution, even if we can't explicitly find our test statistic as one of these six values. Now, like I said on the exam, I will give you a test statistic that is one of these exact values, so you don't have to worry about doing that. Following the exam, we might start to then kind of, I might expect you, we're going to do some more hypothesis testing stuff to be able to put the p-value ranges. But for now, I'll give you one of these specific um, test statistics or t-values, okay? So um, that should kind of wrap up or cover hypothesis testing for one populations. Uh, once we get back uh, next week, um, I will plan on doing some Excel work with hypothesis testing, um, which will also help us kind of get, revisit just how we do hypothesis testing by hand. We'll then do some review on that Wednesday, and then we'll have the exam Friday. Okay? All right.